As people moved into and settled the Pacific Islands, plant materials were used to make clothing. Although the islands had some plants that could be used for this purpose, the most important plants for making clothes were brought from the west in Asia and the islands of Sahul. These were used to make tapa, or what is commonly called bark cloth. Bark cloth is actually a misidentification because the materials used are not really bark but are the phloem fibers found within what we would think of as bark. And the product is not really a form of cloth. Tapa is in fact correctly categorized as a form of felt or thick paper of plant fibers. This contrasts with woven fabric that is produced from a loom. Looms were absent in most of Oceania, but were used in parts of Micronesia and the Philippines. Tapa and bark cloth are terms now in common use and they really refer to the same thing. Although a variety of plants can serve as sources of fibers for making tapa, the plant anatomy, chemistry, and physics are the same. In each case, plant species are selected that produce large numbers of so-called inner bark or phloem fibers. These fibers are very long plant cells Intermixed with the phloem fibers are canals containing latex that is a natural glue used by the plant to seal injuries and prevent insect damage. The combination of long fibers with glue is the basis for using inner bark as paper, clothing, and construction materials. Plant species most commonly used as sources of fibers for clothing in Polynesia and other Pacific Islands include Vauke and Ulu. Each of these plants is native to the islands of the western Pacific region but was brought by a people into the central and eastern Pacific. In addition, some endemic genera of plants were used locally where they were found in different islands. Fig, Ma'aloa, and mamaki are examples of endemic plants that were and continue to be available locally on some islands because they naturally are there but were unavailable for use by people elsewhere. Ancient Polynesians arriving in the Hawaiian archipelago brought along Vauke and Ulu as important clothing plants. Because it would have taken time for Vauke and Ulu to grow to produce new clothing for the early colonists, it is likely that they searched the environment for plants that could provide the kinds of materials needed. Mamaki, which is naturally found in many Polynesian islands, was also found in the Hawaiian archipelago and was likely an important early clothing plant. The Bernice P. Bishop Museum in Honolulu has in its collections examples of many kinds of tapa from across Polynesia. Some of these are pieces donated to the museum by members of the Hawaiian royal family as examples from before or during the reign of King Kamehameha I. As such, they represent the pinnacle of Hawaiian kapa development. Benton Kelee Pang conducted an anatomical analysis of the Hawaiian kapa in the Bishop Museum and discovered that about 80% of the pieces are made from Vauke, a little less than 20% from Mamaki, and less than 1% each from each of the other species known to be used in ancient Hawaii. Although kapa has many uses, the primary is as clothing. In Hawaii, a variety of clothing items are made from kapa and are still recognized. Malo are loincloths for men. They are usually 15 to 30 inches wide by 6 to 15 feet long. They tend to have certain design motifs and colors which are important symbols for men. Pau are dresses for women. They are usually two to three feet wide by five to ten feet long and may be wrapped around 
and worn from breast to knees. These are decorated in a variety of ways. Kihei are capes worn by men or women. These are often tied over the right shoulder. Pahuhula are clothing collections worn while performing certain kinds of ceremonies, such as hula. Kapa moe, or blankets, are produced from five to seven layers of kapa, large enough to fit about a double bed. These pieces are sewn along one side with vauke or hao, cordage. The pieces may be folded back to allow for warmer nights. If made for ali'i, the top layer was dyed and highly decorated, often with watermarks. The top layer is called kiloha. Kapa is used for ceremonial and religious purposes in Hawaiian culture as part of the coverings of images and structures within worship sites. In many cases, very white kapa was used. In other cases, kapa dyed yellow with olena rhizomes is important in some ceremonies. A wide variety of tools are used in production of tapa. Most are made from harder woods. Rounded beaters called hohoa and flat-sided beaters called iekuku are used for the first and second steps in the pounding of fibers into tapa. Hohoa and iekuku are typically made from hardwoods such as kauila or koaia. Wooden anvils called kuakuku are used with the hohoa and iekuku. A preferred wood for kuakuku is nau or kava'u. The hollowed out bottom surfaces serve as resonance chambers with the beating producing musical tones that can be heard far away. It's fun to imagine that at one point in time the Hawaiian Islands must have had a musical tone arising from them simply from the pounding and the regular production of clothing. Tools that are specifically used in Hawaii include ohe kapala or stampers and liners that are made of ohe. Stampers can also be made from other kinds of plant materials such as kalo and hala. The petioles of kalo are what is often used whereas it is the keys of hala that may be used. Hala keys also serve as paintbrushes. Many plants are used to make vai ho'o lu'u, or dyes and dye fixatives for kapa. Much of this kind of knowledge has been lost as people have discontinued production of large volumes of kapa. Examples of plant dyes in the Hawaiian Islands include akala berries that produce a rose color, uki uki fruit that produces a blue color, and ma'o leaves that produce a fleeting green color. Plants are also used as lucchini or perfumes. Examples of plants that are used include aromatic ferns such as lawa'e and peahi. Production of tapa begins with growing selected plants. Long straight stems are preferred. Stems from 1 to 5 inches in diameter are preferred with different traditions recommending different sizes and varieties of plants. Side buds are picked off of the stems as they grow in order to promote even fiber distribution around the stems without any holes. Stems are harvested and cut into sections that are as long as the width of the expected tapa. An incision is made along the length of the stem. Shark tooth implements are traditionally used for this purpose. The entire bark is peeled off in one piece and rolled inside out. As the bark is rolled, the outer bark begins to slough off from the phloem fibers. The bark is then scraped with a shell or knife. Opihi shells are commonly used for this purpose. The inner or white phloem fibers are rolled and allowed to sit for a week or so in a stream or tide pool. This allows microorganisms to break down the resins holding the fibers together, making them easier to work with. After soaking, the fiber rolls could either be stored for later use or traded 
or pounded right away. Rolls stored for later use or trade are dried and then re-soaked prior to pounding. Inner bark is pounded for the first time with a hohoa on a kuakuku. The bark is pounded while still wet. After pounding, the pieces are dried in the sun. After a number of pieces have been produced, uh, they are used together to make a finished kappa product. Prior to the second pounding, when the pieces will be merged into a single larger piece, they are re-soaked in water for about one day in order to soften them. The second round of pounding takes place on a kuakuku. During this process, the rough kappa is further flattened and elongated. Separate pieces of kappa are merged by pounding overlapping surfaces until a single sheet is produced as the fibers merge. The ultimate thickness of the kappa varies depending on how it will be used and who uses it. Thicker kappa can stand up to greater wear but is not as beautiful. Watermarks can be added at the conclusion of this round of pounding. The watermark is the result of differential thicknesses of the felt with very thin layers allowing light that, to pass through while thicker layers block light and together create the desired pattern. Watermarks are produced by precisely beating the wet kappa with scored hardwood beaters incised with patterns. A total of 24 patterns have been recorded, some of these apparently having been developed during the Kamehameha period and with the aid of recently introduced iron nails. As a final step, Hawaiian kappa sometimes is beautified using stamps, marks, or scents. During the Kamehameha I period, some designs were made by rubbing cordage dipped in dye on the kappa or by cord snapping. Scents could either be added to the dyes or stored with the finished kappa. Although the cultures of Polynesia share a common heritage, significant distinctions have evolved over the last 2,000 years. This is reflected in variation in design of material culture, such as tapa and the tools used for its production. Production of felted bark cloth is not unique to Polynesia, but certain features of the processes and products are unique to each culture within Polynesia. Unique cultural features such as these are called apotechnologies. Hawaiian kappa may have small and regular geometric designs applied with bamboo stampers or liners. Hawaiian kappa is noted for having distinctive watermarks. Although a few other Pacific Island communities have watermarks, they tend to be very simple, whereas those used in the Hawaiian Islands are rather elaborate. Hawaiian kappa sometimes is dyed with plant, mineral, and other dyes to produce blue, rose, and green colors. Some of these colors are produced using endemic plants that were unavailable to other Pacific Islanders. Hawaiian kappa is also sometimes scented with pleasant smelling leaves, flowers, or oils. Hawaiian kappa from the early post-contact period was arguably some of the highest quality in all of Polynesia rivaling modern specialty papers used in artwork and crafts. Tongan tapa often has large designs that are hand-drawn. Fijian and some Tongan tapa is made with repetitive designs. Large wooden plates with the designs carved into them are used as models for painting. Plates are passed down from generation to generation and may contain genealogical histories. Fijian tapa is often decorated using stencils. Samoan tapa often is made of two layers that are glued together to hide small holes or imperfections. Design boards with large patterns carved into them are used to create repetitive block-like designs that are painted on the tapa. Tahitian tapa may contain images of plants such as ferns or birds. When Tahitian women were taken by the bounty crew 
It is said that they took only three plants with them for their new lives on Pitcairn Island. Taro, sweet potatoes, and wauke to use for making tapa. New Guinea tapa is made from many different species of plants, including those used to the east in the Pacific Islands, as well as several endemic species of ficus. Intricate designs may be painted in the felt that tell stories or represent family histories and places. Although bark cloth is used in many parts of the world, the English word tapa is taken from Polynesia. Tapa is a good example of a common cultural solution to a general problem. Most communities want clothing for warmth, protection, and social modesty. The phloem fibers of plants offer ready materials that can be quickly and efficiently converted into clothing. Polynesian cultures have each developed distinctive kinds of tapa that contribute to self-identities. These have long served as connections between daily life and the plants that are all around us.